Hi everyone, welcome to HubShots episode 288. In this special episode, we talk about automation in HubSpot and we will cover the two A words and the two E words that we often talk about when we're talking about automation. Automation journey, we do a workflow deep dive so you can understand how to use it, when to upgrade to professional, when to upgrade to enterprise and how we can help you. All right, so let's talk about the framework for thinking about automation, Craig. Yeah, well, so these are the goals that we want uh, viewers to get out of this session. We want you to be thinking about automation in terms of business processes and achieving efficiency. We also want to show you all the different areas that HubSpot can enable automation and then answer those questions. Should I upgrade my HubSpot portal? We get this a lot from clients and then also just how we can help you with that. But, you know, a little bit about us, Ian. I think some people get confused because they don't realize we both run Platinum Partner Agencies. That's right. And they're like, who are we? And uh, Hubshots is actually something that we kicked off seven years ago. And uh, I've got a little uh, image in the show notes there. That's us recording back in 2015, Ian, in one of our earlier episodes. Wow. And then we can see pictures at Inbound with Brian looking very comfortable with us and Damesh not looking at all comfortable. (laughs) Uh, with this, but he was a uh, very good sport. That's right. Look, should we jump into it? I just want to set a bit of the uh, context around this. Um, so, Ian, before we even get into actually looking at HubSpot specific areas, let's just chat about business in general because there's two kinds of trends that are happening at the moment. One is around global and economic conditions. The second is the impact that this is having on knowledge workers. So if you've managed to avoid the news, you will will have avoided doom and gloom headlines like these ones. We've all seen these. And a couple of months ago, it was fears of recession. I think pretty much now it's inevitable. Everyone knows the recession's coming or it seems. Um, so you've got global factors around recession. But locally, well, here in Australia, and I know this is the same for many countries, around the world, it's actually an employment shortage, talent and skills shortage. It's very hard to find people. So never mind inflation and rising prices. If you've got the cash to hire people, you can't even find them. And then when you do hire them, even though we're over the main COVID waves, we've still got massive impacts with people being sick. And of course, traveling opening up now, it's not COVID that people are getting sick with, but it's other flus and things that they're bringing back. And so you're seeing businesses impacted by staff capacity reduced. Now, keep that on one hand and then on the other, think about knowledge workers. Statistically, the majority of workers, more than 50% of workers these days are classed as knowledge workers. There's various definitions for not what a knowledge worker is, but here's my rule of thumb. If you were able to work productively uh, during the pandemic from home, then you're probably a knowledge worker. If you manage to get stuff done, you're probably a knowledge worker. And if you combine those two things, what we're finding is these economic conditions are resulting in two main problems. One, you've got that staff capacity constraint from economic conditions. And so then all your knowledge workers probably comprise the majority of your workers they're actually being pulled off knowledge work, thinking work, creative work, outcome-based work onto filling the gaps with all these areas uh, that haven't been serviced. So they're the problems. And so what we're looking at is these two E words that you mentioned at the start, Ian, efficiency is reduced. Things are getting missed. Things take longer. And the follow-on from that is that effectiveness is not known. We don't even know what's working. We're spending so much time trying to get processes done that were done by others previously that we can't actually work on the things that matter. And so there are two E words and what we want to look at and why the topic today around uh, HubSpot bringing in automation is we want to talk about this business transformation idea and two A words that actually unlock the E words and well, what is this business transformation? So, But let's just define those words, efficiency. I think we've all seen this definition before. Efficiency is doing the things right. Effectiveness is doing the right things. It's great to be efficient and quick, but if you're doing the wrong thing, that doesn't help anyone. The problem we've got at the moment is people are so caught up just trying to get things efficient again that they um, are blocked from doing effective work. And so what we're going to talk about today is actually automation. We're going to dive into automation, because it really unlocks efficiency. 
and it saves you money. And it also provides the foundation for attribution, which provides effectiveness. So the automation and efficiency conversation, that's always around how do I do more with less? And the attribution effectiveness conversation is really show me what's working. Here's some comparisons. Do you want to kind of walk through some of these examples where we just get clear in people's minds? Absolutely. Efficiency. So let's think, think about efficiency. Let's think about having a repeatable process. It's tactical and it's probably very task-driven. I'll give you some examples with that. Example, waiting for your doctor's appointment. Production lines, you know, repetitive manual work, busy work, standard quoting, or e-commerce transactions. They're pretty efficient, but they're very repeatable. Now let's talk about effectiveness. It's more creative, strategic, and possibly diagnostic, and it's more impact or outcome driven. And some examples of that relating to the efficiency ones is surgery by a doctor, right? Or experts doing their thing, or managing relationships. Or let's say, as opposed to a standard quote, you want to go for a very tailored quota proposal and custom transactions. Now, Craig, you posed a very good point here. It's like, was Einstein efficient? Yeah. And, and, and the answer is, who cares? He was exactly. effective. And so what this breaking these down is showing is what we want to do is get skilled people, knowledge workers, away from doing all these efficiency tasks because you can automate that okay. and get them focused on doing the effectiveness tasks. As you said, the efficiency column, we want, we want to get people away from spending time doing that in the efficiency column. That's what automation is for so that they can spend time on effectiveness. And that kind of brings the key takeaway, which is the value of automation depends That's on the right. task at hand and look for repeatable prices. Some people, when we're thinking about HubSpot, we'll, touch, we'll chat with clients and they'll say, oh, look, do I need automation in my business? We're in such and such an industry. And I'm like, that's not the right question. The question is, what tasks are you doing? What are the jobs to be done? Well, let's chat about them because if they're repeatable processes and you want to scale them, then automation is definitely something you want. And there's that kind of almost, don't try and sell automation to Einstein. Don't sell to people who have been unlocked doing efficiency. You really exactly. want to sell the concept of automation to people who are bogged down doing the busy work. All right. Have you thought about business transformation? What's your definition? This is kind of one we've come up with. My, de oh, my definition, go, going from one state to another state, right, Greg? That's what transformation is. Yeah. I think you've got a good explanation here. It's a combination of resilience combined with scalable repeatability. I think the second point is, is freeing up people to work on impactful activities. I think that's such a good explanation mm. because that's what we want at the end, of, end of the day, our work to make an impact on other people's lives, right? Yeah, exactly. And that word resilience, I'll just kind of give a bit of color to that. It's this idea that if people are away sick, then the business doesn't fall over because you've put in automated processes to cater for that as much as possible. That can scale. All right. Now let's dive into some HubSpot specific discussion and let's talk about this outcome journey. We've got a, a really, um, well, tried to make it simple diagram. And if uh, you're watching on uh, YouTube, you'll be seeing this. But if you're listening on the podcast, then make sure you subscribe to our show notes, hubshots.com slash subscribe, and you'll get all these uh, diagrams. But let's kind of explain this outcome focus. Uh, uh, Ian, do you want to kind of uh, summarize this diagram? All right, so I guess if we're looking at this outcome, we're looking at three things, activity, automation, and attribution. And essentially what we want to show you is how that lines up with the tiers of HubSpot. So this diagram uh, will show us, based on activity, what's possible in the different tiers of hubs that we're using. So... Craig, do you want to talk through activity and I'll talk through automation and yeah. then we'll finish with attribution? I, I think the, the tier that you're focusing on has certain um, benefits uh, depending on what you're focused on. So activity, starter and free, they kind of do give you activity. You get page views, you get the activity timeline, which is very powerful. And a lot of free tools there don't have it, whereas HubSpot does. And even in the starter tier, it's very good. And then when you grow into pro and enterprise, you don't get that much increased benefit. but Activity is, is quite strong, even at the starter level. Whereas automation, I'll hand to you, it's not as strong in the starter level, but where does it really shine? 
That's right. So let's say free and starter, you get things like really simple workflows where you might be able to send one email after someone's completed a form or move a particular deal stage. Uh, or send a trigger an email or a notification. So that might be one. When you get to professional, that's when you really unlock everything. And your goal here is to save money. So do more with less and be more efficient, right? So things like you get full workflows, you've got um, sequences in sales professional, you've got surveys in service professional, you've got ads in terms of events and audiences. And then as we go into enterprise, we see custom objects and how that gets utilized. So that's the massive difference between, let's say, starter and going pro and above with automation. Mm. And then when it comes to attribution, which we're not talking about in today's episode, but worth highlighting just in terms of the context, uh, attribution really shines at the enterprise level in HubSpot. So starter, there's some basic stuff. Pro, look, it starts uh, unveiling a few new features and things, and they're definitely valuable. Really, when you're talking about attribution, enterprise is where you want to be. However, automation, and that's what this diagram shows, Automation, it's really at the pro level. And so you get a lot of bang for your buck at pro level. Now, I do want to address one thing, Craig. Mm. People often think about it's a big jump from start to professional, right? Mm. But when we think about the outcome that we want to achieve and the efficiency we want to achieve, that's far less than a headcount of someone actually doing the job and the error that's caused by doing the job. So I think... People often forget, they think about the big jump, but they forget about the big investment if they were to put people in place to actually do those jobs. And so that's the way we'd like you to think about it. All right, so here's some benefits of automation. Uh, So some quick wins. Automating manual process gives you immediate benefit, unlike uh, you don't have to wait for a month to figure out that something's working or not, especially if we think about attribution where you might actually have to connect things to get your data in. It, ha- it saves you time and you can scale it. So speed, accuracy, reducing errors, massive, massive benefit, consistent reporting. And even in the accuracy, I think uh, not even reducing errors is even a time aspect to that in terms of accuracy. Um, and then resource optimization, so freeing up headcount, very important when you think about what we said before. And really understanding that this is a foundation to attribution. So the consistent data input and management is the key to attribution, which we will cover later on. I I really want to uh, echo your first comment there about quick wins because you're right, as you said before, automation, it is a big step up in uh, price. But here's the thing, you, people say, oh, well, how long will it take to, you know, upgrade to pro? How long will it take to get ben- to benefit? And I say, right. What's one really specific business process you've got at the moment that's chewing up a lot of time? Oh, okay, it's that, right. We can take part of that and just automate it in HubSpot. Immediate win. It's like, as you said, not waiting around. There's no big piece. There's immediate win and that compounds. And I think that's the benefit of automation. So let's, Get it just, in place. Yeah. let's just give one example, Craig. Here's one that often we would implement uh, with customers. They're getting leads in or people are filling in forms, right? then someone in the office sits down and decides which salesperson that's going to give it to based on, let's say, the state, because they've got state-based sales teams. Um, and then they might send a follow-up there for a few days later as a survey to see how that conversation went. If you can automate that process, the person in the office doesn't have to touch it. It goes to the right salesperson or the right sales team at the, almost immediately. And then the follow-up process happens without anyone ever knowing about it. And that is something that you can get immediate benefit from and free up that resource, but also get sales talking to the customer a lot quicker. So there's like almost a double benefit there in terms of that immediate automation of that process. Can I expand on that example? Yeah. Because what's if they're getting lots of leads and they don't know which ones they should prioritize first. We've had uh, clients where they've got someone that comes in the first couple of hours, they quickly check through all the leads. Mm. It's not just about assigning them. It's actually Correct. checking which ones are Valuable. high value. Maybe they've come back a number of times. It's like, well, you can just automate all of that. Correct. So then the sales rep quickly call these two leads. That's that right. That saves a lot of time. So 
it's not only time, but it's also opportunity cost because if you don't get to them until the next day, or that, you might have lost the sale. So there's savings and there's also opportunity cost. That's exactly right. <laughs> All right, let's talk about some types of automation. So we're going to uh, split this into four main areas, communication being one, state management, data confidence, and integration. So when we talk about communication, we're talking about things internal and external. So some of the external things would be emails, service, uh, surveys, calendar bookings. And we're talking about um, call transcription also being another one. And internal, things like notifications, tasks, scheduling reports and dashboards to be sent to people at the right time. Uh, the next one would say state management. So life cycle stages and pipeline management when we talk about deals and tickets. And Craig, do you want to do data in confidence and integration? Yeah, people talk about data hygiene, data cleanliness and all of that. I, I prefer the term data confidence. How confident are you that the data is reliable? You can get insights, you can act on it. So that's one of the areas of automation which is powerful that HubSpot can help with. It's actually taking away time, uh, keeping it clean, but also making it actionable. And then finally, not it's a big part, although we're not really going to touch on it too much today. It's around integration, isn't it, Ian? That's right. And this is also important where I think people often forget that there are so many, uh, you can cut out so much error and you can save so much time. So a really simple example, person gets to a particular life cycle stage in HubSpot. If you've got your data connected, you can send the contact details into Xero, for example, so that... Uh, Accounts can invoice the person or send them the invoice. Just the ability to even do that saves a process and time to get that done quicker and to even invoice. And even to the point where you can even invoice with integrations, invoice directly out of HubSpot so that accounts don't even have to do it. So that's the next step along the process. All right. So let's talk about automation in HubSpot and how to enable automation. And we will talk about the few areas, the key areas that people often understand. First one being workflows, and you're probably going to see this under the automation menu. The next being sequences, which is sales-based. Then we talk about ads, which is about acquisition. Um, we talk about surveys, reports, and then integration. All right, Craig, now here's a really good uh, workflow comparison based on hubs. So we basically split this out based on tier and what hubs you have. So let's talk about some of those things that are in free and starter, and then we'll move on to pro and enterprise. All right. So again, this diagram shows uh, that the step from starter to pro is significant. When you think about starter, automation, there's, there's basic automation in the starter tiers, but it's normally based on a stage movement only. It's the deal stage changes, okay, you can trigger a few little actions. When you get to pro, this is where it unlocks everything. You can trigger based on anything you also have a much bigger range of actions that you can use uh, and various other features but really i want to highlight that too that big change starter is just on stage changes pro it's based on anything trigger on anything and that's really important one of the other things we wanted to highlight people often think about workflows in hubspot and they kind of just pigeonhole it as oh a bit of a nurture sequence or a notification i want to get people thinking no, it's, just not, it's not just nurtures, it's business processes. Think about workflows as automating business processes. Just uh, get out of just the little marketing mindset into the business mindset. And so, of course, in the different hubs, you get different features, of course. Uh, I think most hubs, they include contact company and deal uh, objects you can do basic um, actions on but when you get into sales hub you get quotes and quote workflows when you get in service hub you get tickets and then operations hub we're not really going to touch on today but here's the other thing to notice when you go to enterprise it's it's a minimal upgrade so moving from pro to enterprise thinking about workflows there's not much benefit and we'll chat later about whether it's worth it but a spoiler alert it's it's really only two things that might upgrade you to enterprise in terms of automation one is if you want to use custom objects, that's definitely an enterprise. Good reason to go to enterprise. But the second is maybe if you're using sequences a lot and you want extra automation related to those. But really, it's a pro discussion. 
And what we'll talk about later when we're saying, oh, should I buy pro or should I move to enterprise? Often it's, no, don't move to enterprise. Move to another hub as well. You've got uh, marketing pro. Um, should I go to marketing enterprise? Well, maybe, but not for automation. Instead, get sales hub pro and service hub pro because yes. the automation is so strong in those pro tools. Do you want to add anything to that? Um, the yeah. other thing I might probably say is in terms of automation when you go to enterprise is the predictive lead scoring, Craig. Mm-hmm. And that's something that people might be considering or interested in, but that's something else that mm-hmm. will automate some of your um, lead scoring in the platform. Yeah, that's true. That's good. And look, there's plenty of other reasons to go to enterprise, security, all, a whole bunch that's of other right. things. But when we're just talking about workflows. We're talking about yeah, automation, yeah, so that's automation. It's not as compelling. Yep. All right, let's break down the components of workflows. We're just going to go through this quickly, though, Ian, aren't we? Because I think most people are aware of the components, but let's kind of just highlight them and make a few comments. Yep. So let's say we talk about we've split this up into three key areas: so triggers and actions, re-enrollment and unenrollment. These people often forget about that, and then goals and campaigns. So let's talk about triggers and actions. So a trigger is usually to initiate a process. An action is the business process or recipe of ingredients that are in that trigger or that action. So that's the first. The re-enrollment is about repeating the process and the unenrollment is about stopping the process. And finally, onto goals and campaigns, often underappreciated and often forgotten, but this is really a key part of attribution as a foundation where you can associate workflows with campaigns. So very important and encourage everyone to be comfortable with understanding why you use a goal and how you use it in a campaign because this really underpins you in moving ahead. Let's chat about some common workflow examples. I know we've mentioned some earlier in the show, but what's what's some, let's just go through. These are common ones. Yeah, and so we're going to talk about this in the terms of contacts, service, and sales. So let's start with contacts, and then we'll go to service and sales. So a really simple one, contact assignment. Very easy. The next one, contact qualification and lead scoring. Uh, One that people often talk to us about, nurture sequences. So how do we do that? People want to be able to be nurtured in our system. The next big thing is actually internal notifications. And it's not just the standard notifications, but also providing the right information in the internal notifications so you don't have to go looking elsewhere for it. And finally, adding to lists and campaigns. And I'd even add to that, Craig, um, things to do with ads audiences or audiences should be in there as well, which we don't have. But that's to do with contacts as well. Okay, on to sales, Craig. Yeah, well, sales, uh, it's all around pipeline management. That's the big automation unlock. So you can be creating deals, you can be assigning deals, you can be moving them along the pipelines. There's internal notifications. You know, that could be emails, could be tasks, could be a number of things. And there's, uh, it's almost a similar story when it comes to services. So creating and assigning tickets, moving the ticket stages, closing tickets, again, notifications, and then even things like kicking off follow-up post-sale processes, requesting a review. The number of clients we've seen where they go, oh, each week we kind of send a bulk email out asking for reviews. It's like, no, just automate that based on a deal process or a ticket process. Automate all of this stuff. Make it scalable. Also make it resilient. If someone's away that week and they, they're not around to send that out, no, no worries. The automation, the workflow has taken care of it. So, you know, in service, Craig, uh, one of our customers and I've spoken, I've probably mentioned this before, used a service or a ticket pipeline to manage a production process and at each step that was important to the customer because they were building a custom product for, the, for their customer, what they did was they triggered off a SMS and an email to the customer saying, hey, your product is now, this has happened to it. Uh, you know, let's take a car. We've got the body prepared, it's painted, you know. And then, Mm. oh, we've now put the engine in. So people are getting excited along the journey after becoming a customer using the service and the ticket pipeline to understand where their product was in the build stage. And I thought that was really clever. And actually that raises another um, good example, which is uh, creating uh, tickets from deals or deals from tickets. So we've had deals, oh, they go closed one, great. It's handed over to 
customer fulfillment or delivery, great. It creates a ticket, automatically yes. fills in all the details because that came on through the deal. Great, hand it over to customer uh, success. And then we've had, oh, it gets in the customer success, they're chatting, oh, the customer actually is interested more. Okay. Oh, puts it to a stage which creates a deal back automatically and then the flywheel. Hey, have you heard this term flywheel, Ian? It's a great term. I think HubSpot should use it. But <laughs> yeah, it, it just powers the flywheel around so look they're just some common examples and i know over the years we've just seen so many um weird and crazy ones as well but these are just the common ones and you're absolutely right craig the the one i've seen recently was an nps survey that goes out every i think three or six months and in the nps survey someone responded and said oh, i love love this product i actually think i was thinking about buying more can someone please contact me i'm like wow so it was just they were thinking about it and then they got triggered to actually do something because they got the survey. And I thought, what an opportunity. But again, it was automated, right? So there is so much opportunity. I think, I think it also comes back to, are we asking people? Mm. Or have we automated the ask that's happening? And I think that that is also big. It's like I often, people often tell me, if you don't ask, you don't get. And I think, again, in our sales, our service, our process with our customers, are we actually using the tools to ask them at times that we're not directly communicating with them? All right. That was workflows. Yeah, let's, let's talk about into sequences. some of the areas. Yeah, go for it. So sequences used in sales, it's a one-to-one sales communication. It's personalized because you have to personalize it when you um, create or set it up. And it's optimized based on data in HubSpot. And that's what people forget. This is a really key thing. When you're sending this uh, sequence, HubSpot knows when that contact has opening emails from you and then it decides when is the best time to send it to get the best possible result. And we've got an example. It's made up of tasks, um, tasks, calls, uh, and emails that get sent out. And then we've got here a review of how we measure success of a sequence. So how many people have been enrolled, what the open rate is, what the meeting rate is, because often people will be asking to um book meetings what the non-response rate is and what the bounce rate is so this is a really good way to figure out a which emails working what's not working and then optimize your emails in the process as you're going along i I just want to make a a comment around sequences because i think they are one of the best examples of remember we're talking about efficiency and effectiveness and we're saying automate all the efficiency bits so that you can free up people to focus on the effectiveness bits. So two things here. First of all, when you uh, use a sequence, what you're doing is taking away all that manual busy work, but you're still leaving the part that's valuable, the sales rep personalizing that email for the contact. So it's a really good example. They're a knowledge worker. Just free them up to do the knowledge work a bit of that email, that personalization piece. So that's the first thing. But then the second thing is when you do it in a sequence, you're providing consistency. And when you have consistency, you can do comparisons which unlock insights. So by automating all of that kind of stuff, you can now then look at these emails and say, oh, this one was more effective. You see, you've been freed up. If you were just doing that manually, as a lot of people do, I know it seems obvious to look at this in hindsight and say, oh, of course that's the way. But so many people do this kind of stuff manually. And then they don't get the data. First of all, they're not tracking it, so they don't get data. But two, it's not consistent, so you can't compare it anyway. So what you've got here is sequences, a great example of efficiency, but then also unlocking effectiveness. There's an attribution piece here that comes out because you've automated all that busy work. Okay, the next thing is ads. So automate the syncing of audiences between ad platforms. And this is where we often find people waste so much time because they're extracting data, importing data, and then doing it back the other direction or forgetting to do it. Why worry about it when we can automate the data going between the two platforms and get a better result? So a really simple thing. So this is to do with ads audiences. Hey, can I make another comment about audiences? This came up, um, it's actually it's coming up more and more with clients around data privacy. Yes. So people would go into HubSpot because they didn't know about this audience syncing. They would get a list of contacts. They would download it into a CSV. Yep. Then upload it into Facebook and LinkedIn. Okay, that's busy work. This take gets rid of that busy work. But the second thing it gets rid of 
is that data privacy issue. Correct. People downloading big lists of contacts and all their data, mm. there's going to be increasing scrutiny on yes. companies on how they protect this and stop data being uh, exported out. Then it ends up on spreadsheets, on shared drives, all over the place, maybe on people's laptops. It's a privacy uh, legislation nightmare waiting to explode. And in Australia, we've seen a recent massive hacking scandal with a telecommunication provider. It's big news here. But uh, not that they had spreadsheets that they downloaded, but it was just another vector where access to client data was exposed. And this practice that a lot of people go through with they download uh, contact details and spreadsheets, it's just another vector that exposes. And you just don't want to get rid of it. So one, there's the automation piece, but there's actually a, a compliance piece here as well, which I think is so important for companies to be thinking about. Yeah, and I think really important to understand in my recent trainings that we've done with HubSpot and with the likes of Google is that the data between the platforms is actually hashed as it's passed through and that's how matches are done. So they're not passing it raw. And it's really, you have to really understand that how that happens. So this, like what Craig has just explained, is really key to making sure you're doing things efficiently but also the right way. All right, and the next thing you want to talk about is ads events. So take the optimization of ads to another level by giving the platforms the signals and values of life cycle change, life cycle stage changes and automating that conversion feedback. So a really, really great thing you can do here is let's say you have uh, when someone becomes a customer in HubSpot and you, they close a deal, you can pass that they've become a customer. So now they've gone from opportunity to a customer and you can say, well, that deal value was X, right? And the great thing is you're telling the ad platform is this customer had this value and these, and then it works out what the attributes are. It goes, oh, okay. So these customers provide a higher deal value. So I need to go find more of those kind of people when we're optimizing the ads. And I think that's the benefit that we're getting out of using ads events. All right. Talk about surveys, Craig. Well, this is just another way to automate and in when you're setting up say an nps survey uh example here actually our hubshots we send out an nps survey and you can set it recurring i think we set ours recurring every three months uh it's just one other thing again it's not oh waiting for someone uh oh they're on holidays we didn't send out the nps it's just automated also with surveys when you get feedback and you touched on this before might get feedback uh maybe you've got a detractor that straight away sends a task and uh, if they're a promoter, that, uh, that sends a prompt to you to connect with them on LinkedIn. So it's actually, again, just automating stuff. It's surfacing the high-priority tasks that you need to work on, and you don't want to be spending your time doing busy work going in, oh, check the results, what's going on. You just want, oh, and here's a task just for these one or two uh, a day that come in. All right, report. This is another big key area where... Management, sales spend a lot of time, even, even marketing managers spend a lot of time figuring out what's working and is it working well. So scheduling dashboards and reports is a massive benefit. You can save sales and management time in the hours every week by doing this simple task. So setting it up correctly and giving them the information that they need at the right time is a great thing. So often, let's, for example, sales might want to get a sales report on Monday morning. So they know, the sales team knows that they've got to have everything updated by Sunday night because on Monday morning at 8 a.m., that report goes to management and to them. So they know exactly what, what has been sent and it keeps everyone on the same page, but they don't have to spend. I, I've worked with sales teams where people spend two hours plus putting together reports to send to their managers every week. We've just saved them and given them two hours of their life back to do better things, which are more effective in their prospecting. All right, so like we said before, you can schedule a dashboard and don't forget you can schedule an individual report as well. All right, why upgrade, Craig? Okay, so this is a question we get. Should I upgrade my HubSpot portal? Here's some tips of when and when not to. So the upgrade to Pro, I think the summary of where we've come from today is, and especially if you remember that kind of automation 
outcome journey that people have gone on pro that's where all the big benefit unlocks so should you upgrade to pro yeah if you've got repeatable processes and you're focused on improving efficiency then yeah upgrade to pro what's if you've already got a pro hub pro sales pro well are there other business processes? Notice how we're saying business processes because I want you thinking business-wide. Are there other departments that could be improved and automated? That's probably the most compelling path, I would say. So someone says, oh, should I upgrade our, our portal to enterprise? It's like, well, probably not for automation reasons, maybe for other reasons, but the, the stronger conversation is should you cross-sell? Should you upgrade on other hubs as well? And that's really the fit. I think if you get the pro, um, what do they call it? Um, CRM suite pro? CRM or suite, that, yeah. CRM suite, yeah. The pro suite, I think it's such a compelling package. Uh, it is. Uh, with automation in mind. But then when it comes to enterprise, uh, w when would you upgrade to enterprise w with your automation hat on? It's, yeah, as we've said, custom objects, if that's a, a good fit for your business. And also if you use sequences extensively, maybe that's a reason. And that would be a sales pro or a service pro service hub or a sales hub enterprise conversation anything to add to that ian in terms of whether to upgrade uh something else that we don't have on this slide but maybe you're looking at data quality management or data what did you call it craig before data confidence is data the confidence I, I think if you're looking at data confidence upgrading to what's the hub called Operations Hub? Operations Hub Professional. That yep. is where you get that automation in terms mm. of data confidence. Absolutely. All right. We're on the home stretch and there are two main ways that we can help. We can do a quick check session with you. That's a 90-minute session with Ian and me and we go through your entire portal. That's very much at a high level. So you're looking at a general review of your portal, best practices, what can I use, uh, and there are a whole bunch of areas I can use automation. The other option we've got are these new, this is new, this is HubSpot advisory sessions. And you can book in time with us and deep dive into specific topics. And so they're the two options. You can get all the details on our hubshots.com uh, site. And yeah, just book in. Uh, no obligation. You're not locked into anything. Have a chat with us and we'll give you some guidance. But now we're coming to the final slide. Here's the question. Did this session help? So what did we cover, Ian? We covered a framework for thinking about automation in businesses. As we know, automation unlocks efficiency, Craig, and thinking of terms of, in terms of business process. The next thing we think about how HubSpot enables automation. So automation tools like workflows, surveys, sequences, ads, reports and the types of automation. So communication, data, pipeline management, and integration. And then finally, we had a chat about, should you upgrade your portal? And what are the benefits of upgrading to professional? And what are the benefits of upgrading to enterprise? And then finally, how we can help in making sure that your portal is using the best practices when it comes to HubSpot and automation. Well, Craig, on that note, we'd like to say thank you to all our listeners. If you've got any comments, please put them in the comments below and we will get back to you. Until next time, Craig. Catch you later, Ian. Catch you later.